I am very pleased to introduce uh, Martin Dreba, who is professor uh, in the Department of Economic History at Lund University, where he is also the director of the Center for Economic Demography. His research deals with historical and contemporary economic uh, demography um, on topics ranging from mortality to fertility, migration, marriage, and social mobility, which is to say he's very busy. His work has been published in leading demography journals and economic history journals, um, sometimes with folks uh, at, at MPC. Uh, just in 2020, he had papers appear in Social Science History with, with our own Dave Hacker, in Demography with our own Jonas Helgertz, in, um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, in Population Studies, in the European Journal of Epidemiology, and so forth. Um, I am very excited to hear what he's uh, working on now. So please join me in welcoming Martin Dreep. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, I hope you see the slide. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's uh, uh, great to be with you, even though it's uh, um, on a distance. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, uh, income differences in mortality. Uh, and uh, paper that I will mostly uh, uh, speak about uh, has this title, uh, at least provisionally, uh, has it always paid to be rich? Uh, and uh, this is uh, a study that, I've, uh, uh, that I'm working on together with uh, a former PhD student of mine, Enrico De Biasi, and uh, uh, one of the postdocs at our center, Gabriel Rea Martinez. Uh, and the paper is also part of uh, uh, Enrico's uh, dissertation, uh, which deals in more general with uh, SES differences uh, in mortality. And so we've been, uh, uh, for example, the paper that, uh, that Rob mentioned with uh, Jonas Helgels and Tommy Bengtsson that we published earlier this year, uh, we looked at social class differences in adult mortality, uh, total mortality. Uh, and uh, we have also uh, uh, recently worked on a number of, of other similar uh, studies using somewhat different uh, sources uh, and some somewhat different outcome variables uh, and designs. But on the general topic of uh, socioeconomic status and, um, uh, and mortality. Uh, so today we'll look at cause-specific mortality uh, by gender and for adults. So no infant and child mortality uh, today. Uh, so before coming to the um, uh, more uh, focused income uh, uh, study, uh, I want to say a few words uh, about uh, uh, more generally on uh, socioeconomic status and health, then we'll, uh, we'll uh, um, smoothly uh, go into to income. Uh, and um, so one place to start is uh, with the fundamental causes theory. And uh, uh, some of you, uh, I'm sure, are familiar with, uh, uh, with this idea. Uh, and for those of you who are not, it's, uh, it's fairly simple. Um, the, uh, the idea is that socioeconomic status uh, and the resources that are, that are connected with it, so money, power, prestige, networks, knowledge, and so on, uh, promote uh, health and, uh, uh, under uh, different circumstances. Uh, so the more precise mechanisms linking SES to health and to mortality uh, uh, depend on context. Uh, as uh, diseases change, mechanisms may change, but the, there is always an advantage uh, uh, of, uh, of being of high socioeconomic status. Uh, the only possible exception, I will come back to that, is, uh, is when diseases are uh, largely non-preventable and uh, uh, there is no knowledge on how to uh, how to control the disease at all. But apart from 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 in those uh, those instances, uh, there is uh, uh, usually a relationship between SES and health, 
because being advantaged um, make it possible in different ways, not in the same way uh, all the time, uh, depending on the disease, depending on the context, it will be different ways that the advantage can, uh, can take uh, um, advantage of the situation and, and improve their health. Um, so just three uh, examples of this, uh, we could think of, of, uh, of cholera uh, um, in the 19th century, uh, high SES groups in many places could avoid, uh, e easier avoid areas with, uh, with high risks, uh, uh, perhaps through migration uh, or, or the choice of residential uh, location. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, heart disease, uh, high, high SES uh, uh, people uh, had better knowledge uh, about lifestyle, uh, perhaps better access to treatment, which would, uh, would produce a similar uh, advantage. Uh, smoking, a uh, third example, um, in, in, uh, in most cases, I think, uh, in the smoking transition, the low SES group was slower to change. Uh, smoking behavior first uh, when, it, uh, when starting to smoke and then uh, what has been more uh, researched when uh, um, starting to stop smoking and that uh, produced uh, SES differences in smoking-related uh, diseases. Um, in a paper a couple of years ago in demography, uh, the uh, fundamental cause theory uh, got uh, a little bit of an update and a, a good one, uh, I think. Uh, and in the paper by Clauston and uh, uh, I think link at least is, is part of the, the, the authors as well. Um, we can think of the, the, uh, the process uh, uh, as going disease by disease, basically. Uh, so uh, here you see there are, are four different phases. Uh, the natural mortality phase that I talked about previously, uh, where there is not enough knowledge or, or, uh, uh, or at least not uh, measures available to, uh, uh, to control disease and to, um, uh, to reduce mortality. Uh, in that phase, uh, we may not expect much socioeconomic differences um, in, in mortality. Uh, it, it will be difficult even for the high SES people at least intentionally, to uh, to affect their uh, their health uh, to to a greater extent, uh, and I think th this is an important uh, addition uh, to to this uh, to this theory, and it's also one which uh, many historical demographers have have criticized uh, in the past. Uh, then, in the second phase, uh, we there is some kind of innovation, uh, improved knowledge or, or, or something else uh, that uh, makes it possible to reduce um, um, the, um, uh, the risk of contracting the disease or perhaps a treatment. We can think of this uh, in, different, uh, in di different ways. Um, and as soon as those that possibility uh, uh, emerges, there will be uh, SES differences because the high SES groups, they will be earliest to, um, um, to take that uh, opportunity to, uh, to improve their health. Um, and so that will produce uh, the inequality. And then, uh, in, the, in the next phase, the, the lower uh, SES groups will, will catch up but perhaps not fully. So depending for some diseases, there may be some residual difference also here in the, in the final period um, uh, when, uh, when the, uh, the transition here has gone full circle. But the idea here is that this is then uh, reproduced disease by disease. Uh, and 
when we look at it from a total mortality perspective, uh, over time, it will look as if the uh, uh, the advantaged SES group always have lower mortality uh, and better health than the low SES uh, groups. Uh, with this uh, important provision here uh, in the first phase, which uh, which has uh, often been uh, often been forgotten. Uh, so in the literature, there has been uh, some other views as well. I already mentioned uh, some, some uh, uh, critique by historical demographers that I won't uh, talk more about uh, today. Uh, but uh, this paper by Antonovsky from the late uh, 60s uh, is often cited in, in this literature. And uh, what he argued was that there has been a variation over time uh, in the um, uh, SES differences in, in health and, and, and in mortality. Um, and not exactly in the way that uh, uh, was implied by, by the previous model, uh, but uh, some similarities. So in his uh, periodization here before about 1650, there were small uh, SES differences because diseases were highly virulent. Uh, and uh, it was difficult to protect oneself against, uh, against disease. So that's similar to the first phase in the previous model you saw. But then already uh, in the period 1650 to 1850, uh, um, SES differences widened and um, uh, related to increased uh, economic inequality and also less uh, uh, virulent infectious diseases uh, that led to, uh, to, uh, to them also being more nutrition dependent. And then in the, in the period since uh, the mid 19th century, uh, there has been, according to this view, a narrowing of the SES differences uh, because of lower economic inequality, more equal health care and so on. And if we look at the actual development, um, so since the 1970, uh, about, we are talking now developed countries. Um, um, the, we are on fairly safe grounds, I think. There is uh, a large body of research uh, that has shown the um, a clear uh, uh, gradient uh, in adult mortality or life expectancy. Um, pretty much regardless of the measure of, of SES. If we look at education differences, class differences, uh, occupational status differences, income differentials, uh, there is a, uh, a mortality gradient. Uh, and uh, Michael Marmot named a book after this uh, called The Status Syndrome. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing that I think is also fairly uh, clearly established is that there has been a divergence in these differentials since about 1970. Uh, so we have seen larger uh, socioeconomic differentials uh, in, in mortality since 1970. And th this is clear uh, in, in Sweden, it's, it's clear in many other European countries. Uh, what is not so clear, however, uh, is when this gradient first appeared. And that's uh, what we have been uh, uh, looking at and what I will also show you a little bit here uh, in just a minute. Um, in terms of pathways, uh, mechanisms, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the literature is full of different hypotheses and uh, also of focus studies uh, that uh, zoom in on on uh, most of these. Uh, lifestyle has uh, uh, gotten a lot of attention, uh, contemporary context, smoking, diet, alcohol consumption, uh, role of exercise, uh, vegetables, and, and so on. So there is a huge literature in contemporary epidemiology on these, uh, on these uh, factors. Uh, unequal access to healthcare, uh, residential, um, segregation uh, relating to environment pollution, things like that, uh, has also been uh, uh, stressed. Uh, Marmot uh, uh, 
argued that psychosocial stress was uh, was important, the control of the work situation. Uh, and he found this very strong gradient even among the civil servants, uh, uh, and even when controlling for uh, uh, several of the lifestyle uh, factors. And that led him to, uh, to argue strongly for the psychosocial stress as, as an important um, uh, determinant. And in uh, parts of the literature, there is also uh, um, an emphasis on early life conditions, so things happening very early in life that can then uh, produce uh, these um, uh, changes. Uh, so before uh, moving on, just a final word uh, for the introduction um, about socioeconomic status. So, so far, I've been talking fairly generally about this um, um, as say some kind of uh, measure of an individual's standing in society relative to others. Um, and uh, uh, where ACS is a kind of combined uh, measure that, uh, that reflects several uh, different uh, dimensions. And uh, those that are most often uh, studied uh, are income, class or education. And what I want to, to, to stress, and, and uh, I will also uh, show some, some evidence of here, is that these dimensions are not completely overlapping. Uh, so uh, I think it's best to view, uh, view them as uh, uh, at, at least partly independent, not completely independent, of course, but partly independent uh, dimensions that together form uh, what we uh, call socioeconomic status. So, so, and and that's how we have worked with this, looking at uh, looking at social class, looking at uh, looking at education, looking at income. Uh, yes. So, uh, before moving on, uh, is there anyone who wants to? Now I can't see anybody, so uh, you just need to to um, make yourself heard if you want to interrupt here. All right, so this table here is from a, um, a study uh, about 10 years ago um, uh, by Jenny Tosando and Robert uh, Eriksson, uh, where they looked at Swedish uh, census data to which they linked uh, 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 records from the death uh, uh, registries. So these are full count uh, data. Uh, they look at people in 1990, uh, 35 to 59 years, and then they follow uh, up in the period up to 2003. Uh, and um, what you see here are results from their uh, bivariate uh, uh, models. So one model for education, one for class, one for occupational status, and one for income. Uh, and uh, here at the top, uh, it's quite clear. You see the educational gradient, uh, lowest mortality in the college, uh, uh, more than three years, uh, and highest mortality for those uh, with only compulsory school education. Uh, if we look at class, we see a similar class gradient. If we look at income, we see a clear income gradient. Um, so for all these uh, dimensions, there is uh, the, um, the, the mortality gradient. Uh, now, when estimating models with uh, all of these dimensions uh, at the same time, or at least several of them at the same time. Uh, you see that uh, even if uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the gradients in, in some cases uh, change a bit, uh, it's, uh, it's clear, for example, here for men, that the income gradient uh, is, uh, is quite stable uh, even when controlling for uh, for both uh, both class uh, and uh, uh, and education. Uh, when we look at the um, long term pattern, 
which is the uh, the main aim of the analysis that we are doing. Um, we uh, in previous uh, uh, papers we have looked at uh, social class uh, and uh, adult mortality. We have also looked at. Uh, social class and infant and child mortality, which I won't uh, talk about. Um, but looking at um, a class and uh, an adult mortality, uh, we um, find a fairly late uh, emergence of the class gradient. Uh, so it's not until after about 1950 for women and about 1970 for men that we, uh, that we see uh, the the contemporary gradient. Um, we see it uh, earlier in younger age groups. Uh, we um, uh, find signs of uh, reverse mortality differentials, and I will come back to that uh, a bit later on here. Uh, in the early 20th century, uh, for men, uh, especially in circulatory diseases, which we linked to uh, adverse lifestyle in, in these high class uh, groups. Um, we found that class differences emerged uh, at about the same time for uh, all uh, causes of death. Uh, a bit earlier for women uh, um, uh, in infectious diseases uh, and then uh, we uh, found earlier class differences uh, for, for children. So causality is uh, uh, usually a topic that comes up uh, in, in studies like this. Uh, and uh, um, the, um, there are empirical, uh, I mean, theoretically we can, of course, we can think of uh, causal effects from income or from, from education or from social class on health uh, for the reasons that, uh, that we have um, uh, just uh, talked about. But it's equally possible that there's uh, a reverse causality, more healthy individuals will most likely earn higher income. Uh, they may get uh, better education and attain higher class positions. And there could also be uh, uh, third uh, factors here, like early life conditions, for example, which, uh, which could uh, uh, have an impact on both, uh, both health and SCS. Empirically speaking, uh, since the literature is so large, there are uh, uh, studies uh, that find evidence for all these different errors. Uh, so uh, there are designs, uh, uh, twin designs. There are some economists that have done lottery studies and uh, uh, similar empirical designs who have uh, demonstrated um, causal effects uh, from SS uh, income, for example, on health, uh, but also studies that have found little of this uh, and instead found uh, uh, signs of, of reverse causality. So the, I wouldn't say downside, but the, 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 the design that we have and the data that I, I will show you, uh, we are using, uh, does not lend itself easily to experimental uh, studies uh, trying to establish these causal links. Uh, so what we are doing is focusing on the long-term pattern uh, to, uh, to give a picture of when do the um, uh, mortality gradient emerge, uh, for which causes of death, and in, in what age groups, for which genders. Uh, we do not... Uh, claim uh, any particular causal uh, uh, link uh, in, um, in what we do. So about the data. Uh, we based both this uh, study and uh, the previous uh, that I mentioned uh, 
uh, on a, a regional um, sample uh, with detailed information from uh, continuous uh, population registers uh, that actually go back all the way to uh, 1815. But in this study here, where we include uh, a city, we have data from 1905. Um, and those population registers uh, have been linked to uh, uh, vital event registers for the same period, and also to income and taxation registers. Uh, the historical data we have goes until uh, 1967. Uh, and then we have linked those registers through uh, unique IDs uh, assigned to all Swedes uh, who were alive in 1947 and later. Uh, we have linked them to the national registration, um, which means that before 1967, uh, the sample is confined to a geographic area that I will show in a minute. Uh, after 1967, from 1968 onwards, we can follow up people from that area uh, and also their descendants, regardless of where in, in Sweden they live. Uh, so th this is not a major uh, advantage for, for, the, for what we're talking about today, but in, in some other things that we do, th this, is, uh, this is quite important. Um, the historical data, uh, so 1815 to 67, contains about 175,000 individuals, and the linked data in total, uh, about 825,000. Location, southern Sweden, one industrial town uh, with a population of about 14,000 in 1900, uh, increased to 25,000 in 2000 bit higher actually, mid-century. Mid and then there is also a, a rural or semi-urban semi uh, couple of parishes in the surrounding area um, with, uh, with a population of between five and 10,000. Um, so in the analysis, we work with these different periods uh, and uh, they, I mean, they are partly, uh, Partly, they are structured by the data. So the starting starting point uh, is governed by the data. Uh, the 1967-68 division line is also, as I just explained, uh, related to the data. Um, but the peers also make uh, sense in terms of the societal development. Uh, and um, uh, the first period we are in, in still in, in the industrialization phase. Uh, urbanization, uh, living standards are increasing, but uh, Sweden is still a fairly poor country in this period. Uh, healthcare, obviously underdeveloped, uh, uh, public welfare also. Um, 1922 to 49, uh, this is a period of considerable economic growth, but also we have the Great Depression in, in this period here. Uh, we have the Second World War, which didn't affect uh, um, Sweden directly, but indirectly, of course. Uh, also a period of early welfare reforms, uh, improvement to urban infrastructure. Uh, it's a period when, when especially cigarette smoking uh, uh, picked up uh, quite a bit uh, in Sweden. Uh, the post-World War II period until uh, about 1970, this is the golden age of, of, of economic growth um, uh, in Sweden. Uh, it's also uh, beginning of uh, the real development of the welfare state. Uh, smoking is widespread. Um, 68 to 89, uh, we can view this as a kind of the culmination of the welfare state. So it's a continued development of the welfare state, including the healthcare sector. Um, and, uh, but uh, in the period that comes after 1990, uh, there are some uh, cutbacks. Uh, it's a period of increased economic inequality, uh, privatization of, uh, of the welfare sector, uh, and so on. The uh, exposure and uh, the number of individuals and the deaths in the different periods, uh, you can see here, in total, uh, there are about 2.2 million person years lived 
um, and uh, about 35,000 deaths. Uh, so the data is structured longitudinally. So we, we follow individuals from, uh, from uh, the um, age 30 or when they uh, came into the, to the area uh, until age 89 or when they leave. And then we count up all the exposure and we, uh, uh, we assigned uh, all the deaths and uh, uh, the variable we use, uh, uh, income, for example, time varying, uh, social class time varying, um, um, and some other variables, of course, are, are not. Uh, a few words about uh, the income data. Um, we use uh, individual uh, tax returns, uh, which were introduced in, in 1903. Uh, we have individual records for married women from 1947. Uh, so taxation was joint uh, in the couple until 1971, but married women's income uh, were reported uh, separately from 1947, but not before 1947. So before 1947, for married couples, we only have their uh, joint income. Uh, there were uh, thresholds, which imply that everyone did not have to file a return. <clears throat> so we assigned those uh, who, uh, who were in the registers but did not um, uh, have a return. We uh, assigned half uh, the threshold. We also did some sensitivities. Uh, we'll mention if, if time permits. Um, we include all income from work, self-employment and benefits related to previous work, but we don't uh, include capital income or real estate income. Uh, for those over 60, we use the income between 50 and 59 as a proxy. So for, and that's important. So for those retired, it's not their pension income, it's the income they had uh, during their active life. Uh, for the city, we only have income data every five years until 1947. Uh, after 1947, we have annual uh, data. We are in the process of registering uh, also the intervening years, but uh, in this particular study here, we, we uh, uh, only had data every five years. Uh, so we imputed those uh, missing years uh, based on uh, uh, information uh, on income and individual HISCO codes for those years uh, where we have real data. Uh, and uh, uh, using a regression approach, we um, uh, um, use age and HISCO uh, to predict uh, those who are nearest neighbors, we could say, those who are most similar in age and HISCO code, uh, we uh, um, use uh, their income information to impute. Uh, and um, then we uh, also, uh, CPI adjust these incomes uh, and make a little bit of an evaluation using, uh, using the genie. I won't spend too much time on this, just want you to uh, have a look on the left uh, graph here. Uh, you see the orange dots, those are the imputed values, and, and the blue triangles are the real ones. Uh, and, uh, and you can also see the whole uh, series uh, when we have, uh, we have the annual data. But by and large, uh, those imputations um, um, look quite stable. Um, yes, then we estimate the individual income uh, when we have family income uh, for the husband and wife, uh, we divide it equally. And for singles, we use their uh, individual income. Uh, we run a regression uh, with cohort, year, and sex. Uh, and then we uh, uh, keep uh, the individual residuals uh, by year. We take a mean uh, for three years of those residuals and we base the quintiles on those, uh, on those residuals. So this gives us a, 
Um, it, I mean, it's not a permanent income measure, but it at least is a smoothed uh, income, uh, relative income measure uh, that will not be so sensitive to, to temporary uh, variations in income. And this is how the uh, uh, income look by social class. And um, the um, uh, farmers are the yellow bars here. And farming is uh, was, uh, always a special category and especially when it comes to uh, recorded income. Uh, but if we take away the farmers, you see that uh, for most of these uh, periods, there is the kind of relationship that you would expect, <clears throat> but you also see that it's not it's not uh, uh, perfect in the sense that uh, uh, these uh, income differentials are always in the expected uh, uh, direction, or that they are always uh, of a similar magnitude. Uh, on the right here, just look looked at the, uh, uh, the income relative to the medium skilled workers. And, uh, and, and then it looks here as uh, inequality has gone, gone down tremendously over the 20th century. But it's really only for this group, higher, uh, higher professionals, a little bit for the, for the low professionals. But the higher managers and higher professionals, uh, they earned about four, four and a half times as much as a medium skilled worker in the first period, but only uh, less than two times as much in the second. But for the other groups, uh, it's not as big uh, as big. And this just shows the, uh, the income in the different, uh, uh, some of the, the different quintiles. Cause of death, we look at uh, using uh, two different um, um, classifications. Uh, one is a classification um, uh, in a preventable, non-preventable, uh, and, um, and the, this is based on uh, uh, what is judged to be a preventable uh, uh, disease today. Uh, and of course, that's problematic uh, looking at this historical, but it still, it gives, uh, it gives some kind of an idea what has happened to, to this uh, group of diseases looking over a long period of time uh, with only the three, uh, the three groups. Uh, but we also use the uh, 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 six group classification here based on the uh, uh, International Classification of Diseases, uh, the ICD-10 um, into these groups, infectious parasitic diseases, circulatory, respiratory uh, cancers, other courses and unknown courses. And we make some sensitivity analysis uh, also, especially for those other unknown courses because they, they vary a little bit over time uh, in, their, in their prevalence. Um, course of death analysis over long period of time, that uh, is a topic for uh, at least a couple of seminars and we won't have much time to go. Um, these are just the descriptives. Uh, so uh, preventable, that's a big chunk of all the deaths, um, as you can see. Uh, and here are the, uh, uh, the other causes, uh, the um, uh, infectious diseases that the bottom blue here that um, kind of almost disappear. And the orange here that increases and then decreases a bit, that's circular. <clears throat> circulatory uh, diseases, uh, heart disease, for example. Uh, we model this uh, using a competing risk uh, hazards model, um, where which is basically just looking at uh, each disease group separately, uh, censoring the uh, uh, those who die from other uh, from other causes. Uh, we have a limited uh, number of control uh, variables, but the, the focus here will be uh, on the uh, on the mortality uh, uh, on the income uh, groups. All right, so I will start uh, uh, by showing the um, 
uh, results for the all cause uh, uh, mortality. And um, the reference category here is the bottom 20% of the income. And then uh, it's uh, in, uh, in quintiles. And if you look here at the final period first, which is where we kind of benchmark to the, to the contemporary studies, uh, you see the perfect gradient for both men and women, uh, which is uh, fully in accordance with uh, other, uh, other studies and many other studies uh, uh, in the contemporary period. So that's good. And uh, we think that shows uh, that the data is not uh, completely off, at least not for, uh, at least not for that period. Uh, you can also see the, the widening of, of, of the differences uh, compared to the, the period 1968-89, uh, which is also uh, in accordance with, uh, uh, with previous uh, results. Uh, but you can also see that if we go back here to the early 20th century, there is almost, uh, there is no consistent pattern, basically. Uh, so in some cases, there is some odd um, estimate here uh, for women in the highest group. Uh, for men, it's the uh, next highest group that uh, is a little bit lower than these are high. But no consistent pattern uh, until about 1950. Uh, in the period 1950 to 67, the gradient start to emerge. It's not perfect, but it starts to emerge. It's more clear for women uh, than for men. Um, so it's a somewhat earlier emergence than we found for, for social class. Uh, but for the early 20th century, uh, it's similar. And here you can also see this uh, this higher uh, uh, mortality for the top group. That I, uh, if we look at preventability, so uh, as you saw before, uh, preventable uh, deaths are the uh, uh, majority of all the deaths, and so they look uh, similar to the um, uh, to what we just saw for for all cause mortality. Um, well, depending on how you read these figures, uh, the, the pattern is perhaps clearest for the preventable, uh, but it's, I would say, it's similar for the non-preventable. Uh, so the, the uh, inconsistent results for the first two periods uh, we see for both preventable and non-preventable, the uh, emergence of uh, some kind of a gradient uh, is also similar. Uh, the patterns are not exactly the same, but, but they are they're definitely similar. So the, these are for men. And women uh, look uh, um, uh, quite similar, especially for the last uh, three periods when we have a, a systematic gradient, uh, it looks uh, similar for, uh, as it did for men and similar. Um, if we look at the core specific, uh, it's more difficult to, uh, to show in a clear way, but here are the six different groups uh, for men. Um, so same structure as before. Uh, these are the hazard ratios by period for the different uh, income groups. And it's quite clear that looking at the last three periods, that's when the gradient systematically uh, emerges. Uh, it does so for all the different causes. Um, you see for infectious diseases, uh, there seems to be a little more of a pattern. M many of these are not statistically significant, but there is a little bit more of a similar pattern for infectious diseases, but for the other, uh, uh, not very much. Uh, I also want to point out here in the top middle figure, the circulatory diseases, uh, you clearly see this higher uh, mortality for men in the top income group. 
So a reverse mortality uh, a gradient, or at least uh, a re reverse mortality differentials um, from circulatory disease. And this is similar to what we have seen looking at social class, both using full count census data and, and, uh, and uh, the data I showed here. Um, and uh, we uh, uh, cannot prove it, but we uh, uh, definitely believe that it's related to adverse lifestyle, uh, earlier smoking uh, in particular uh, in this group. Um, and just quickly also for women, um, patterns are similar, but perhaps not as, uh, as distinct uh, as, uh, as for men. Uh, we made a number of sensitivities here. I won't go uh, into them in detail for the interest of time. Uh, most of them uh, just uh, show the robustness of, of what I've just said. Uh, I want to, um, to highlight uh, uh, two things. Uh, when adding a control for social class, income gradient remains largely unaffected. So similar to what I showed you for, for the uh, study from uh, uh, to Sandra and Ericsson, uh, and also that the gradient emerges earlier among younger men than among older men. Uh, so to conclude, has it always paid to be rich? No, uh, at least not in terms of uh, adult mortality. Uh, the income gradient, as we know today, uh, is of uh, relatively recent origin, uh, emerging around uh, 1950 uh, in, in, in our context. Uh, in the early 20th century, we actually found higher mortality in some disease groups for the top, uh, for the top earners. Uh, the income gradient uh, is uh, rather independent of, of uh, social class. Uh, and the gradient emerged uh, both for income and for class uh, in a period when the welfare state uh, developed uh, and uh, Sweden experienced uh, tremendous economic growth. Uh, and we uh, think that that suggests that lifestyle and health related behavior uh, are uh, an important part of the picture. Uh, it's um, uh, difficult to rule out, for example, uh, the kind of psychosocial stress factors that Mormont uh, points out uh, might well be uh, important here as well. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, sorry that I didn't make more stops along the way, but I uh, watched uh, my, my clock eagerly here. So, uh, But now we can probably leave for some questions. I will stop sharing here so I can see. All right, great. If you have questions, again, just a reminder, you can use the chat box if you wish. Otherwise, um, feel free to use the raise hand function or just unmute yourself to ask your question. Hi, I, I do have a question. Um, so I was wondering if there, uh, you mentioned there was a big change in um, uh, with Sweden coming uh, being a rich country. So I was wondering if a lot of people uh, became to a uh, to be in a higher uh, socioeconomic status, and if you see that that was like a, like a big change in general in all the health conditions you study. Uh, well, I mean, yes, uh, so um, there are, uh, I mean, over this century, uh, a little bit more actually that, that we study, there are enormous changes in, in almost every aspect of, uh, of the welfare state, of the health conditions, uh, of the living standards of, uh, of, uh, of most people. Uh, and uh, the uh, so the compositional changes um, I think is more uh, uh, more of a problem let's say uh, when looking at social class. So when we looked here at income, uh, we uh, uh, we looked at uh, quintiles, uh, and of course the um, uh, 
um, the actual monetary difference between belonging to bottom quintile, top quintile will not be the same in both these periods. So it's a kind of a relative, uh, a relative uh, uh, me me measure of income in that in that sense. Um, but but I it's 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 very clear from both this way of measuring it and also uh, measuring it uh, by social class directly that we see the emergence and a widening also of the uh, uh, socioeconomic differentials at a time uh, when most objective measures actually improve uh, in terms of health, in terms of economy, in terms of living conditions. But basically everything uh, that we can measure is, is better in, uh, uh, in the end uh, than in the beginning. Arden, can you say something about the nutritional status of the lower income group? I mean, famine's not a problem anymore. Are, there, are people getting enough calories? Are they able to fight off infectious disease? So in the first period, when, I mean, this would be mostly, uh, I think, important, um, the, um, uh, I mean, there were definitely poverty uh, um, in this period, uh, no, no doubt about it. And uh, the, there is a convergence when we're looking at budget studies, for example, there is a convergence um, between the, uh, the, the social classes from, let's say, the late 19th century to the to the early 20th century in terms of nutrition, the kind, the diet that, that the different uh, classes are, are consuming. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, in that sense, it would, yeah, I mean, it would not be unthinkable that you would, that you would see more uh, differentials than you do, I think. Um, but, but I suppose the, the fact that we don't see See it, and and from what, what what we have looked at before. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the city data going back into the 19th century. <clears throat> but look, looking at at the rural sample for the 19th century, we don't see any uh, differentials in adult mortality at all in the 19th century either. Which uh, which at least tells us that nutrition was not so compromised that it had a big effect on adult mortality. For children, it's, uh, uh, there are some differences going uh, towards the end of the 19th century, not early in the 19th century, but towards the end of the 19th century. And also in urban, in urban uh, uh, contexts, uh, they're, they're definitely, we, we see that for research on Stockholm, for example, that for children, you'll find uh, the, the differences that might be related also to nutrition. Hi, Martin. Um, I'm a social epidemiologist. I'm Teresa Asabuck, and I uh, enjoyed your talk. I'm curious about this. You, you are mentioning the psychosocial mechanisms. Uh, and in social epidemiology, there was a raging debate 20 years ago of the psychosocial versus material pathways that, um, that the literature engaged in, which generated more heat than light. <laughs> um, so I wondered if you had, I mean, this is more historical, but if you could test these psychosocial mechanisms, how would you distinguish them from the material pieces? Um, I mean, I think in social epidemiology, we've come to believe that both of them are important. They're on a causal path, a common pathway. Um, so how do you think, what do you think is most important? I mean, obviously the health behaviors are really important um, and there are psychosocial aspects of those, but also the stress pathways of power are really important as well. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I don't think the, 
So the historic, I'm not sure that the historical analysis will help us a great deal here because uh, we don't find very much differentials when we go back in history. And so the differentials we find, they are mostly in, in the contemporary period, which is also what, what uh, uh, social epidemiology has been, been working on since uh, for, for, for a long time. Uh, and I'm not, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously income in the way we measure it is partly, of course, is a proxy variable. So even though I said that there is not comp no complete overlap, and even if we, we, we control for social class, there are, you will still see the, the, uh, the income gradient. And, and you, I think you, you, can, you can also uh, do that the other way around and uh, say that, okay, we control for income, you will still see those status differences uh, from occupation. Uh, so, uh, but if they are behavioral in the sense of health behavior, smoking, those kinds of things, or if that's related to, to psychosocial, we have no direct evidence uh, in our data to do, for example, what, what they did in the Whitehall study where they had some direct information. We don't have any smoking um, uh, evidence. Uh, I mean, we have actually, uh, for, for a much earlier period, in the beginning of the 19th century, we actually know if they pay tobacco tax, but that's, uh, that's way before uh, this, this period we're looking at here. So I'm, I'm not sure there is that much we can, we can do, of course, what, what, what can be done is that you can look in more detail at the occupational, uh, so within classes, let's say, uh, within the white collar uh, class, you can see what, what um, you know, managers uh, versus uh, lower managers and so on. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's hard to completely separate it from, from the other factors. But I you think. still see a gradient among those whose basic need, needs have been met. Absolutely. Is that, yeah, so that's some of the evidence that the people advocating for psychosocial mechanisms advocate for. Then the material people say, well, the material level still is you know, better with each step that you go up, even though the basic needs have been met. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, The material things accumulate. So, I mean, it's not completely clear, but at least there's not, you don't see a complete, a threshold effect. Um, no, no, I mean that, the, uh, I mean, I, so the way I, the way I would interpret it, uh, not, 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 that, not that I can, you know, prove that in any hard way given our data, but I think just, just looking at how the gradient emerge, uh, during a period when everything improves in terms of material, I mean, in terms of healthcare, in terms of, in terms of living standards, in terms of housing, in terms of almost, uh, uh, all, almost all the material uh, uh, parts. Uh, I think that those direct material aspects are probably not driving the emergence of the gradient. I mean, that seems almost unthinkable. Um, but uh, uh, and 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 also that that the whole gradient would be a result of some kind of increased negative selection. I also find quite hard to believe. Um, uh, so so that tells me that uh, most likely what we are down to here: uh, uh, lifestyle, health-related behavior, uh, and and those psychosocial. Uh, mechanisms, I, I still think uh, could be important. We don't have, so there might be something for uh, different access or at least realized access to healthcare that could be playing uh, something here. Even though we have a universal healthcare system, there are still, you know, people are not looking for, uh, are not seeking health to, to the same extent in all these social groups and so on. So there might be a little bit of that too, I think, but, but I, I uh, I definitely think that the um, those, those two um, health-related behavior and uh, and possibly uh, the kind of relative positioning in in society the the, the, the stress aspect. 
Yeah, All right. I agree. Thank you so much. Okay, and then with that, I think we are out of time. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you for presenting today. Um, we've really enjoyed it. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you so much. Bye, Martin.